And we are live here right now with the incomparable MC Bravado. What up, what up? Good to be here. How you doing, man? Man, I'm chilling. I'm happy. Uh, you know, the album promotion, despite the chaos in the world, is is doing okay. Uh, obviously, with everything going on, that weighs on it a little bit. The inability to, like, do shows weighs on it quite a bit. Because yeah. that was, like, main cathartic thing I would do with my time was get on stage. So, kind of been trying to fill that void. Uh, but aside from that, you know, life is good, man. Word up, man. So, how have you been filling that void when it comes to uh, marketing, the album, pushing the album? How have you found other creative ways to get the word out? Well, I think like in terms of like marketing budget and marketing dollars, like the best usage of that, at least me at my camp has been uh, target marketing, you know, on YouTube and on socials and just trying to get my music directly to the people that I think would rock with it the most. Um, I send it to everybody I can as far as journalists and outlets go. And if they post it, beautiful, I, you know, I appreciate it. But uh, that used to kind of be my end all be all, like just hoping so and so would post it. But now, you know, obviously the game has changed quite a bit and you can do things differently and mix it up and, and start to thrive. So um, that's been the case. I've been doing some brand partnerships to kind of bankroll everything um taking my time you know uh formulating the right plans making sure it's beneficial for the brand seeing what they want before i'm telling them what i want um and it's been good man we've been able to you know our second video is out now for that discourse joe rogan record um and i'm gonna release like three more videos uh off the project all while peppering in lucy's that that didn't make the project um and other singles to kind of keep the new listeners interested while i'm really promoting this album for upwards of a year you know yeah do you see the same value in having your music on websites or blogs it's not so it's kind of twofold like it's not you know like obviously you're well versed in the blog era uh with if back in the day like the first record i put an album out in 2012 and i remember it got on two dope boys and i was like over the moon you know um i still think it matters um, I think, you know, tastemakers and people that, that really give a shit about the craft will always matter and their voices will always matter, but it's not the same, like, if you get on X amount, you're breaking through type thing that it, that it used to be, you know, certain artists, as you know, like, got their start that way, like that, that really put them on. So I think there's value there. Um, the value now comes more to me in like building, a, you know, a Wikipedia using your press or like getting the press you need for verification on all these platforms, which in turn will will help your visibility and, and all that and leaving that SEO trail for, for people to find you. So then when you do want to do brand partnerships, you look viable enough. Um, it's not the same as it was, but there's still plenty of value. It's just shifted, I think. Yeah. Where do you go to find your music? How does discovery take place for you? Uh, my friends, man. Just people I, you know, I've accumulated uh, relationships in, in this industry over the years and, and people I keep in touch with or work with will usually just text me something and say to give it a look. Um, and obviously, like uh, following my favorite artists on social media, if they drop something, I'm going to I'm going to check it out. But as you know, an independent artist trying to start my own or start, we started our own label like I am so immersed in my own universe, like I try to stay aware of what's going on and obviously give the people that that propelled me in, to want to do this a listen whenever I can. But like, uh, I don't have like a designated place that I'm looking. What it's about interesting. You? Yeah, it's interesting. I'm, you know, I don't, I don't check websites by the hour the way I used to, you know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, for call it almost 20 years, I guess I spent most of that time, most of those years, every hour seeing what's happening on DX, every hour seeing what's new yep. on Two Dope Boys, every hour seeing what's happening over on All Hip Hop or whatever. And now, most of my discovery comes through my friends or people who, you know, um, put me on to something like you mentioned, and then social media. I mean, really, really more what's happening on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, I think, you know, and which is, on, and I'll be, I'll admit this, it's a bit disconnected in the sense that um, I don't see, I don't get their story or their backstory the same way. 
You know, I get, the, I get their song, maybe I get a visual, and then I have to go search on my own if I'm interested past that point. So, you know, when I do go to publications now, it's generally for editorial purposes. You know, like I like what Audio Mac is doing because it at least yeah. points out different, you know, innovations in how people are approaching, you know, the industry and the economy of and the business of selling music. You know, I check out the Trapital uh, newsletter, Heavy, you know, just because they point out different, you know, behind the scenes moves that are different company or, or, or how different companies are positioning themselves, you know, but it's so funny. I'm, I, I couldn't imagine, I guess I could imagine in a sense, in, in a sense it does feel like it's a bit of a throwback to maybe what the nineties were like a pre, you know, blog era when, okay, there was a monthly magazine you checked out that had all the details in it, you know, yeah. and some combination of radio and television is where you got the rest of your information. Because when I think about playlisting and I think about uh, different streaming platforms, now that it's more, most of my time is spent on songs rather than artists or albums in a different way, it feels to me a little bit throwback in its progression. See, I never, I never even thought of it through that lens. That's pretty, that's pretty on point. That's pretty on point. I, I to to build on the uh, the blog previously, like yeah, I, that evolution's crazy. Like scrolling on like hip hop game for like who put a new record out just that mad that massive list and trying to figure it out that way and i agree with you you don't get the you don't get the background and the story like you once did unless you do more of your own investigation and the other thing that i think was nicer about back then is more kind of more quality control i mean you can figure it out for yourself there's still plenty of diamonds out there but like you're also sifting through more that's not so good uh because of accessibility so many more people are doing this and I, I sound like the old man on the soapbox but you know when i started in i don't know oh two i'm going to freestyle battles not knowing who i'm facing and there's 32 other motherfuckers there and i'm getting up there like with the beat on just having to like not die you know and like then if i'm in public i'm aware of where i am who's nice over there what do i have in my back pocket for him and and mixing that in with the free and kind of just like maintaining my samurai status you know like that doesn't right. it's not that it doesn't exist there's still spitters like obviously <laughs> like me. the whole nature of it has like has shifted that way and I, I i don't think it's all bad but i do always wonder like if not for that ease how many more would be fa you know fans than uh than artists so it's i don't know I, it's a complex dichotomy that i think i'm still trying to figure out and get a feel for it and when i do speak on it i never want to sound like the elder statesman who's who's hating on on the next gen so try to be supportive and, and to listen and really understand it you know it's funny when i think about certain things you mentioned rap battles right i'm always mm -hmm. interested in naming conventions you know like you know what prefixes or suffixes are popular during any given time Right, like there was a point in time where all the names were like Grand Master, Grand Wizard, you know, they're just big, you know, aggressive, you know, almost, you know, CEO level, karate black belt type style, type naming right. conventions, right? And then everybody was real big and fat at one point. It was like Fat Boys and Heavy D, it's like everything was just like heavy. And then <laughs> the first little I remember is Lil Dap, uh, he's the first Lil I remember. I'm not saying he's the first, but he's the first one I remember is Lil Dap. He was in um, Group Home, DJ Premier's okay. group. Uh, okay. Malachi Lil Dap. And then everything became Lil again. And there's still a lot more Lil's now than I expected there to be. But there's not that many people who still have MC in their name. And you sure. still do. You know, what mm -hmm. is there, um, have you thought about just naming conventions in general? and? Have you noticed that there's less MC something and less MC whoever than there was at a different point in time? Yeah, so no, I have been, I've thought about those conventions and the, and the prefixes a little bit, uh, not to that extent though. I didn't really realize the heavy, the heavy and the grandmaster thing. Like obviously I was aware of it, but I didn't put it together like this era, then the next era. Obviously the Lils, uh, 
you know, with the, with the JBP always referring to them as that, um, that's always in the, in the forefront of my mind. Um, I, it's in my name just because, and this sounds like kind of corny maybe, uh, but it just reminds me of like my responsibility of how I should be if I step on stage or if I, if I get in the booth, like I take this craft very seriously. Um, I think, you know, prior to being a full-time MC, I, I taught English and I, I like, I, I'm just, I try to be a writer's writer and, and be aware of all the elements that I should bring to the table as a performer, as a master of ceremony when I am on stage. And yeah, there aren't too many, uh, you know, MC at the forefront of the name isn't much of a thing anymore. Um, it's almost become like, I've noticed it, like it's become uncool to some people to be good at putting words together, which seems kind of ironic given the genre. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know what to make of that really. Uh, I don't know if that's like a, an old head defense mechanism, like kind of just like, oh, well, we're going to make fun of you for this, for being too too complex or too much going on. And there's something to be said for that middle ground. That's really what I try to achieve with this Living Game album. Um, I wanted to hold on to that technicality, but also make it much more palatable for like, for like your everyday person, you know, while yeah. still feeling like a consummate MC, you know? So that's, that took me, I had to quit the job like and and be all in and and have nothing for a while to like make that to make that record i think i really had to find myself i don't know if i found myself fully as an artist until this that record right you have the mamba mentality poster or plaque behind you uh, I do. like kobe like kobe i thought was a great start to the project and Thank i you. think it connects well to what you're describing now you and joel ortiz really go in on that track thank you bro that was like just a moment like just to hear his voice I won't forget when I got it when he sent the vocals and just to hear him come in is just like it's hard not to stand in those in those moments you know uh and it's but at the same time you're you're on a record with the killer so like you don't want people to hear that and just be like oh yeah congratulations for you know getting bodied on your own shit uh so <laughs> I try to bring it uh and felt at the end of the day that like I sound like I belong next to him on that song. So that felt really good. And he's such a cool guy too, through the whole process. Like he was a lot more, he communicated with me a lot more than I expected and seemed to have a vested interest in the process and me as an artist. So that was like, just, I don't even want to say it's surprising. Cause he always kind of came off to me as like a, a good dude, but I guess when, that whole like your heroes will let you down thing like definitely did not apply to to Joel. Yeah, he has one of the more interesting careers to me. I think about that 2006 Double XL. I call it the first freshman cover, but it yeah. really was called Leaders of the New School. And Joel Ortiz was on there, Crooked Eye was on there, um, Lupe Fiasco was on there, Saigon was on there. Uh, young Young Dro, OJ the Juice Man, cats like that. And mm -hmm. outside of Lupe Fiasco, pretty much all those spitters got shelved. Like Joel yeah. went through that heavy, Crooked went through that heavy, Saigon. Man, if that, if Greatest Album, Greatest Story Never Told came out then, like he got shelved while he was on Entourage. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it was, it, yeah. it was a very difficult era to be a wordsmith in music. Yeah. And Joel was one of those cats for me that I never really felt like got the marketing push he deserved. That is until, you know, Slaughterhouse, you know, gave those guys sort of was a rebirth in competitive and seeing in one capacity, but also to me, their timing was also a, a return of the group in a sense yeah. as well. You know, I'm always amazed at artists who, still prioritize lyrics in this day and age or still prioritize emceeing in this day and age. Have you ever felt any pressure to evolve from your core principles in order to reach a new market? For sure, man. And you, and you hear those, act, not only from people you talk to in the industry, but even from people you know uh, that are kind of just who fuck with you and what you do, but want to see you win. And in their estimation, they think that that's the way to winning. Um, 
I, and even as an artist, I, you know, I've, I've created some content that I would call um, a little bit more modern. Most of it I haven't released yet, but it's kind of a, it's a side thing. Like it's still MC Bravado, but it's more going to be like just a, a different EP, like to show some versatility there. But the crux of what I do is always going to be this. And I feel I have to no, look no further than like, you know, I, I mean, like a, the style that a boot camp click did, like they them sample, like that shit, that hard hitting shit, that lyricism, that boom bap, like that will always have a place. And I try, I try to tell people that like, we've had these different eras of what's like all the way on top, like that, the nature of that changes era to era. But like, if you're dope, with the boom bappery, like you could always fucking play a packed show somewhere. Like that's not, there always are people that's been a constant, you know what I mean? So like what sells sells like mega stardom sells. I don't have the pressure to be that. Like I want to be somebody who continues to create uh, a nice living for myself and eventually the people I care about while making the music that, that I want to make and building something I mean, my goal, I call, I'm trying to build something akin to like a, a Rhyme Sayers East Coast, you know, where I just have a roster that's diverse and, and fire in their own way, but, and pushing some boundaries, but like sticking to a certain code and feel. And I just think there's always going to be a place for that kind of music. You can have shades of whatever's going on if you want, but like, I, li I literally do what I feel like doing and put it out. And I feel like people get the best version of me that way. You have another song, I think, that just dropped maybe beginning of October. Um, I think it's called De Denial. Yeah. Is that, is that a, that one felt a little bit outside of, you know, some of the sounds that are on the, the album in a way. That, that's what I was talking about with, I yeah. mean, it's not on EP yet, but that's going to be a collection of that kind of thing. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. I, you know, I, 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 Merce is a good friend of mine and, I feel like Mercer's made every type of <laughs> album. Like he's done stuff on, or every label he's been on, Rhyme Sayers, he's been on Strange, he's been on Warner, you know, he's put out an album, a Christian leaning album, you know, like, and I'm always, uh, he's done stuff with Ninth Wonder in multiple capacities. And yeah, I admire that sort of, you know, willingness to be an artist before you're being, or limiting yourself to being a brand. Yeah. You know? He's, I love Felt. Uh, I mm. actually haven't gotten through the new one yet, um, but I'll probably listen to that shit this weekend or something now that we are talking about it. Um, and it, I agree with you with him. It does seem like whatever he jumps into, he, it's like that project and he's not, he's not trying to adhere to uh, something he set for himself or what people expect necessarily from him. I think that's, something to be said for that and as an artist it's just fun to do that like I'm, I'm always working on my main project like what's next but while I'm doing that I'm always working on other shit that's fun and to the side and a lot of that hasn't seen the light of day yet um but it's it keeps me refreshed when working on the stuff that I think it cl most closely adheres to my brand because then I get to go do the the fun stuff because the main thing isn't that fun for me because there's so much is racing through my head in terms of like expectations and like how people are going to receive it. The other stuff, I, I kind of give a fuck less, you know, I'm just like, this is just making music, you know, it's back to how I started uh, in a way. What's the most difficult part about starting a record label? Oof. Uh, building it to the point where it could support more than one artist. <laughs> building that infrastructure. Uh my partner is a former edu another former educator in Baltimore. Um, we worked at the same school, but not at the same time. And I had heard of this guy and he had a studio and this and that, and, you know, being in this for a while, obviously you're like, okay, another producer, another quote unquote studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, then I met him and a lot of our principals are here and we were both passionate about education in this city. And um, we started building from there when I got back from Warp Tour summer of 2018 i quit my job to jump on warp tour and i got played the 40 shows or, or what have you and and got back and had nothing you know to my name and i was like bro if this is going to work for me we got to partner up like i can't afford to pay for studio time anymore like this that like it's got to be that kind of thing and then i get you uh in any way i can so we kind of figured out our splits our percentages 
our business uh, and start, I just got to work. Um, and from there, my videographer, Mike John, um, came into the fold and there's a certain budget for him with each thing. And we're bringing in an intern or two now. We kind of got an in-house production team of three or four guys that we're doing like a sample free version of the album that we're going to try to really get some licensing dollars on uh, and pay those guys uh, for what they've been doing for us. Um, my DJ, uh, you know, Moose Jaw is also my band. Like he's kind of in the fold and just building it to a point and bankrolling it to a point with these partnerships that we can expand, I think is the hardest part. Um, Cause it is like, you talked about, it's a label. Well, who's on it? Well, just me. It's like, <laughs> that's, <laughs> just makes me feel a certain way. So like, I'm really pushing right now to, to get things scaled and, and bigger and actually have a, an office space near the studio type thing to where somewhere physical, I think there's just something to be said for that. Even being able to work remotely to just like the logo of label necklace on the door and here's where we are for business, you know? Um, yeah. I think that's the tough part is the expansion. I think that's really, uh, I, you know, you might be the first person I've heard say that they're, looking to have a physical place since COVID-19 hit. <laughs> that's, that's fair. <laughs> You're the first. I've talked to a lot of people <laughs> over uh, this quote unquote quarantine. And uh, I, I have questions about that actually too. It's what is going to be the future definition of professional for, you know, over the next 18 months? Because I do think there's a huge difference be, when you can just go by and see somebody versus when you can't. Like cash money, right? Mm -hmm. To me, baby should be the head of Universal. If they did their business right, there's no way he's not running that entire company. Who's made more money than baby, right? You go from juvenile <laughs> to, uh, uh, to Drake, <laughs> to Nikki, to Wayne, <laughs> just the sheer amount of money that Sure. They've been able to make through the business of selling music. And never once have I seen Cash Money headquarters. I see them yeah. on boats. <laughs> I see them <laughs> in houses. I've never seen, I, I've never seen, you know, their plaque on the wall and the door in the building <laughs> that you can stop by <laughs> and just take pictures for the grant. You're, you are definitely right. And that does, so like, to kind of, explain that better from what what i really want there you you see kobe on the wall i got nipsey on the wall i got jordan on the wall i like to look at these things when i wake up and kind of start my day that way and i think that place would be not only like a physical and it would be humble like you know but it'd be a physical reminder of how far i've come for when those weeks are dragging or i'm having a tough time uh, and, and beyond that, like as a creative and a writer, as I'm sure, you know, sometimes it's just freaking healthy to like get out of your room or your living room and take a walk somewhere and get that light on the way to the, the quote unquote office and to just have to be somewhere to add that structure. Cause without it, um, things can go pretty, you know, awry. I definitely, when I got back from tour, was having a really hard time with this, like, well, what do I do today? Like, how much time do I spend on this? Like, holy shit, look at this list of things. This isn't going to get me paid right now. I need money though. Like, <laughs> you know, like, uh, that structure is important and I'm figuring it out. But I think like, when I am building this roster and adding more people to this equation, something like that might help them with being structured as creative too. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I mean, I wasn't necessarily saying it was a good thing, Cash Money. I've never seen their office. I'm not saying they don't either. They might have, no. I'm sure they have something, but I'm just, <laughs> I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm just saying that, man, you know, when people sell that many records, they get big time jobs. <laughs> he's one of the only ones I've never seen with that. You know what I mean? He's not like, their deal wasn't like, you know, like no limits deal. You know, like Master P did most of his stuff through distribution. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. I'm uh, trying. I would love to. I need to learn more from these guys. I need to read more of what they wrote. I need to study their patterns more. Um, these are all goals goals for me down the line. I tend to focus. I think it's good to focus on the art. Uh, but if I want to get to where I want to go with the label, I I need to like really figure out some patterns between these guys and I don't think I've done enough outside of listening to the music and knowing X, Y, and Z. I don't think I've done enough homework on really how they built what they built, you know? Do you find yourself listening to other artists while you're creating or 
to benchmark the marketplace? Or do you kind of just separate yourself from what's happening in the macro environment when you're working on your stuff? Pretty separate, pretty separate. Somet sometimes I'll hear something from a Joel or a Lupe or like Lupe's uh, dinosaurs like really motivated me to write uh, just cause I thought it was such a brilliant metaphor. Um, I, he's, he's someone that will always inspire me to push the boundaries just cause I think he, I, he's so probably at the top for me as a lyricist, you know? Um, so when I hear something from someone of that caliber or, or a Royce, really any of the slaughterhouse guys, like that will either put me in a mindset of, or a black thought, like that'll put me in the mindset to write either some crazy battle rap shit or some crazy conceptual shit. But like, usually I'm kind of in my own, uh, my own bag and just writing away. And uh, I used to outline everything and then fill it in, but now I kind of just let it fly, let it fly, let it fly. And then find that common thread, you know, which inevitably happens if you're writing about your life. Um, you're inevitably going to find those, those common threads and be able to lace together a project that works. Um, I think I listen to a bunch of shit. I have a pretty eclectic palette. Um, I think somebody who put me in the mindset to make the living game album was, uh, was Jay-Z. I mean, Jay-Z is the goat to me, uh, simply because if you kick in something like, uh, like the iceberg effect, Hemingway's iceberg effect, right? Like you can see the surface, he could jump on anything and it sounds dope. The flow is there, it works, but he also will hit you with something that, you know, if, if you're not really listening, you're not gonna catch and it'll sound comfortable on any record while doing it. Um, I just think that kind of longevity is so remarkable and while being universally like appealing un universally, but still like bodying shit lyrically on those smash hits is for so long is kind of like unprecedented. So like, I, I have a variety of barometers and, and feels that, that I go for, um, but it, it's those, those heavyweights that, uh, you know, that dry, I guess ultimately drive me, even if I'm not plugged into whatever they just put out or something like that. Well, I have one more question for you, but is there anything else that you wanna, you know, talk about or do you wanna make sure that we, we touch on before we, we wrap up here? Um, no, I mean, I'm sure at the end, I'll just, you know, push people towards the video and the project and, and those kind of things, but I don't have anything um, specific. No, there's nothing coming up over the next six months that you're excited about that you want people to look out for or some digital tour that's happening or some, you know, South just by, you know, Zoom version that's coming up. Yo, so I think I'm getting down on that, but uh, I'm not gonna lie, bro. I'm not the i'm not thrilled with the social distancing show shit like if you come to one of my shows like i play with a fucking six piece band like i'm in the fucking crowd i'm jumping in that motherfucker state doing whatever i can to like let people know that this is a unique experience and like i know we got to adjust and move but like i haven't done shit performance wise because i and it, it sounds like a spoiled kid like i'm taking my ball and going home but like i don't I don't want fucking five motherfuckers over here and five more like a half a mile over here in the back of a pickup truck and then five more 10 feet that way. Like I can't, I would feel disoriented. Uh, so performance wise, I got nothing tour wise. I got nothing. Uh, it's the living game album. You know, I'm putting out uh, three more records or three more singles slash videos after this discourse Joe Rogan record, which has been, you know, a timely one and an important one. Um, I do like talking about that, uh, just because with the climate we're in, you know, um, having conversations, you know, is important, even if, even if you have the moral high ground, in my opinion, I think I would never question that certain people have the moral high ground. I just think like you, what, for example, when I was teaching, right, I'm talking to the kids and we're having conversations, we're debating in class, the city like mandated, like uh conversation frames like i heard while while i heard what so-and-so said i disagree because i feel like some of our adults need that you know which is, is wild uh that you know some of the kids i taught in 10th and 11th grade had better debate decorum than you know grown-ass people uh i but i think we need more of that i think there needs to be uh if you disagree with someone and you have the moral high ground in your mind and you probably do, that's fine. But that, do, that isn't like an end all be all for that person being a total piece of shit. And there's much more gray than we, than we get. 
Um, and I want, I want more of that. I think more fruitful conversations and, and more love is, as cliche as that sounds is like really what we fucking need, um, to, to come together more. 